And I woke up this morning with the strong desire to share this principle because there are 10 of them. But for some reason, I felt like I want to go over this first principle of yoga. That is the access to our deep happiness. Uh, for those who remember, yoga has 10 principles, jama and niyama. And when we live by those 10 principles, that's when we live in a life for being, practicing balance, harmony. And when we're practicing balance and harmony, when we're practicing the principle of God's universal laws, we cannot be unhappy. We just can't. And it's really hard to practice them. But when we bring consciousness to those principles and we do our best to follow them, we do we really do experience this harmonious happy life when i see i am distressed somewhere i see that i'm breaking one of those principles and the moment i catch myself and i bring back those principles fully in my life the harmony comes back does anybody remembers which principle was first of jama and niyama it's okay the first principle I so. yes Beautiful. Good job. Good job, Peri. Ahimsa is the principle where we're not hurting anyone physically. We're not hurting anyone with our word, because it's also action. And we're not hurting anyone even with our thought. And the same principle applies to ourselves, where we're not hurting ourselves, not physically, not with our words that we say sometimes to ourselves and even with our thoughts. Where do you see yourself authentically where it's hard for you to balance this? Because when someone... Oh, I'll go first. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Samantha. I knew exactly when you said that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I shared earlier that I have been going through some struggles with Viv's dad. And I know, I know when I think, when I let my mind be like, oh, you are so annoying. Oh, blah, blah. when I think that way to him, he gets more yes. and more difficult. And I know when I think softly and wish him happiness, it is better. And so I've been diligently trying so hard lately to be like, no, yeah. I love him and I love everything. <laughs> yes. It's amazing how Ahimsa works so quickly because the moment someone is hurting us, our part, in if we're looking in our chakras, our lower chakras, want they turn on immediately. We want to revenge them. We want to hurt them back, either by words, saying something to them, or wishing harm to them. But what happens when we're wishing someone harm? And we're thinking even harmful thoughts. We're poisoning ourselves. But worst part of it, we're accumulating the karma. And whatever we're wishing them, it comes back to us. And it comes back to us maybe in a month, maybe in six months, maybe a year. But it definitely comes back. And that is the problem with humanity. If there would be no ahimsa, there wouldn't be no war, there wouldn't be no conflicts, there wouldn't be no divorce, there wouldn't be any struggles in life. But how can we live in Ahimsa if we're not practicing spirituality? We're not even going to bring that thought to the surface because naturally our lower chakras, they're like, oh, I need to say something back. <laughs> I need to wish them something harmful. Or you're thinking, or oh, I hate him, I dislike him, he annoys me, I'm frustrated with them. This is all ahimsa. And that is so hard. And it really <laughs> is mind-blowing where it's only thoughts. I've got great self-restraint from I don't speak it, I don't... My daughter would never hear anything like that. Like, she's, he's the greatest guy in the world to her. Yeah. But just my thoughts, it's almost like because I control everything else, it's like instant with my thoughts. I'm like, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But you see, first it's a thought, but then the thought turns to feeling. The feeling turns to your mood, and then all of that aura turns to that thought of that mood and that feeling. And so that anxiety, that frustration and anger 
is now polluting you and it's polluting someone who is next to you. And it's just an illusion. It's in our head. It permeates our body and our aura and our flow. And then part of the ahimsa also is, for example, we go outside and we see a beautiful flower and we're taking this flower. We're actually hurting that flower as well. But I understand the difference between hurting a human versus hurting a flower, a big difference, right? In the same way, I remember when I met native Indians, I saw their prayer. Their prayer is very different. They pray to earth, they pray to moon, to the sun, to the nature, to the deer that they're thinking to go hunting in order to feed their family. And they said, that's what we used to do. Now we don't. But if we're ever in a situation where we're starving, we will do that. But we'll pray asking for nature that we need to survive. Now there's a no need for that. But there's so much respect to the nature, to, to all of the animals, because they're also creation of God. They're a living being. And so if you have a choice, eating beef or let's say vegetable or chicken, choose chicken because it's less developed than, right, than a cow that is very advanced animal. If you have a choice between a chicken or vegetables, choose vegetables because in a kingdom of animals, yes, they have to eat each other in order to survive. But if we want to just satisfy our taste, we're also committing to ahimsa. And we just got to bring that awareness and that consciousness. Yogi monks are saying, in the kingdom of animals, if animal is afraid of another animal, it's a victim. And so tiger or lion will catch the antelope because antelope is scared of lion or a tiger. If an animal is angry, which is, again, part of the fear, that means it's either, again, lion or tiger. It's going to hunt prey. But as a human beings, we got to overcome the feeling of fear and anger. And yogi monks who overcome the fear of anger and fear in the past, they would meditate and the tiger would be sleeping next to them because the tiger feels that the monk doesn't afraid and is not aggressive and angry. And there it's no prey and it's not a victim. And that is a hundred percent ahimsa where there's no aggression, anger, and there's no fear. And that's what ahimsa gives to us to being in so much acceptance tranquility, peace and calm within ourselves. And obviously ahimsa we can achieve if we're not hurting anyone. But if we're not hurting anyone, we're really trusting the Creator. We're connecting to Him. And we're connecting to Him either through prayer or meditation. But we got to start bringing awareness. What is our thoughts? Towards ourselves and towards others. What are we saying? And what are we doing? Who wants to share anyone else who is struggling maybe somewhere else where you're thinking negatively about yourself or close to ones? And at that particular time, after we had our little um, misunderstanding, I remember coming back home and trying to heal myself. And the only thing that could work was to to repeat to myself that I wish her happiness. That was the only thing that was working, just saying that I actually wish her happiness and I don't want anything to happen to her and I forgive her. I remember repeating to myself all those things and I kept saying, if I forgive her, then it's going to be easy for, for me to move on. And that has stuck with me even nowadays. Before I used to be very vengeful, but I found myself never wanting to revenge Nowadays, I'm not vengeful. I'm quite forgiving. As much as I have, I feel the need to wish them happiness, and I do, maybe they are not in the same 
case as I am, that is, they did not wish me happiness. So, for example, the example I gave about my, my friend, we study in the same class. So she still has the grudge against me. And I genuinely, for, I want to forgive you and I've forgiven you and I want to talk to you again. But she does not want to talk to me again. So I'm wondering, is it that it's not working because I have forgiven you, but but you are not you you do not want to still talk to me as much as you know. Even if she will never talk to you, when you wish someone happiness, you are not attached whether she'll speak to you or not, whether she likes you or not, whether she wants harm to you or not. Because when you really, truly disconnected and forgive someone and wish them happiness, you really wish them happiness because maybe she's in space of pain. Maybe she's struggling. Maybe she's jealous. Maybe she is something else going on in her life. And she doesn't want to be with you, friends or colleagues or talk to you. It's okay. That is her own space. You are not going to be attached to that be a friend with me. And that's why when sometimes people break up, you got to wish them happiness. Even though it hurts you, you want to be with them. But they made a choice to move on. You don't want them harm. You wish them happiness in order to energetically fully disconnect and you're a free person. And when you're a free and happy person, you're going to be gravitating towards people who love you and appreciate you and who wants to be friends with you, who want to be in a relationship with you. That's it. No attachment. It's a free will. Let go. Fly bird. And that's it. Otherwise, it's like, I forgive you, but you you got to be friend of mine. And you're holding a bird in your arm. Let her fly. Let her fly. Let other birds come in your hand without squeezing them. Like that. And some people will have a choice to be friends with you. And be in a relationship with you. And some won't. And it's okay. Fly for those who don't. It's okay. Yeah? Great. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anyone else? Anyone else who wants to share? If you feel like you are struggling somewhere between yourself or someone else with regards to Ahimsa. I, um, it's funny that Edith mentioned forgiveness because... I've always found it easier to forgive people. Um, I'll use the example of, you know, my past relationship. There was a lot of hurt between my um, ex-husband and I, but it was very easy for me to forgive him, actually. Um, it was not easy for me to forgive myself with the things that I allowed. And um, my family and my friends, they're, you know, like I said, they're very supportive. And so when I speak to them, a lot of them are like, you know, you put so much blame on yourself and like on your own shoulders, you know, and I, you know, have stopped blaming myself in my mind, but it has really taken me a lot to get to a space where I don't, where I can say, you know, Ayana, you know, I can forgive yourself. It's okay that you made those choices. It's okay that you took those steps. Um, it's okay because it led you where you are right now. Those things are fine, but it's really taken a lot of effort to not to not put that blame and to and to be gentle with who I am in my learning process, mm -hmm. um, and not to put so much weight on what I expect of me, because it's definitely more than what others are expecting of me. Um, and, you know, at the time and for, you know, for a few years now, it's been more than like more than, you know, what's good yeah. for my development, you know, yeah. in my, in my progress yeah. as a woman. Yes. So, um, it's been interesting to become aware of like, you know, the fact that I'm not being gentle with myself. I'm not forgiving myself yeah. and I'm just kind of in that space and consider Ayana, all of that had to happen because without these exams, we're not learning, we're not growing. And on the next relationship, you will be so gentle on your soul, on your body, on yourself, and you'll treat others to be gentle with you.
You will fall in love with yourself so much, accepting yourself, becoming so graceful, so feminine, that no one will treat you the same way ever again. You will know deep in your soul and in your heart when someone is harming you, you'll put a stop, you'll communicate, or you'll walk away because you'll see that this is not aligning with who you are now. Because Ahimsa starts with us. I'm not harming me. I'm treating myself with love, respect, and dignity. There's no Ahimsa between me and myself. Then how can you attract anyone that will be hurting you? It will be impossible. Because who you're going to be is just nothing but deep love. Deep love for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I think for, for me lately, I get very frustrated with my mom in particular. And I've noticed that um, things are just like little trivial things have kind of been coming up um, now that it's getting closer and closer to the arrival of my baby. And it's one of those things where I definitely, I don't wish harm or any ill will on my mom, but just things where, um, you know, especially because now that we decided at first she was going to um, stay with us for like the first couple of weeks when I had the baby and we decided not to do that anymore. So she's like, Oh, you're punishing me, you know, those types of things. So I have a lot of these thoughts of like, Oh my goodness, she's so annoying. She's so frustrating. Um, and those are the types of thoughts that I have, um, or that she's very transactional with her love of like, Oh, because she did certain things for me, then she's expecting something in return. I hear you. And what is the impact on you as you are saying to yourself, oh, she's so annoying, oh, she's so frustrating, oh, it's, she wants things her way, it's transactional. What is the impact on you? I think the impact, you know, just because I don't know how to deal with it yet, and I feel like I probably haven't matured in a way that I can still, is that now I feel more and more that I just... I mean, not that I would cut her off completely, but it's like I went from wanting her to like stay with us for a few weeks to like not wanting her to stay at all. So is it going to get to the, so now is it the impact where I'm not going to have my mom very involved at all? You know, like, could it get to that point, which, you know, at first that wasn't my initial intent. So it's almost like, I've also just realized for a while that I, I can have a bit of a an avoidant attachment style in general. I think just the way that I was raised and the way I used to treat other relationships in the past. And even that I, I still kind of treat my friends and family members this way, that when something isn't going well, I just completely like detach rather than like facing it or facing it in a immature way. So I feel like how it's impacting me, I'm like, oh, okay, now am I just not gonna have my mom involved? because I don't have the maturity to deal with it. Thank you, Gabriella, for sharing. Because you see how you're connecting to your lower chakras and it's like, okay, I don't want you to be there at all when the baby's born. Mm -hmm. And this is in a way punishment. And that's what she's saying, really, yeah. right? In Ahimsa, you gotta connect to her because she's a mother. What is her world? What is she dealing with? Because for moms, especially our moms, our, their generation, they were not about happiness at all. It was all about survival. And their love is all about transactional. Oh, here's the food. That's my way of saying I love you. Here, I bought you jacket that you wanted. This is my way of love you. And what can you give me, right? And in a way, we understand that it's not unconditional love. It's not the love that we want because, Mom, I'm pregnant right now. All I want is your understanding. 
All I want right now is for you to adjust to my mood, to my hormones, but you are demanding things and you want things your way and I cannot do it this way, right? And in her world, she wants to be needed, but she wants to be needed in her way. And her way is I'm older, I'm your mother, I know things. <laughs> and in your way, I'm a daughter, I'm a pregnant. Can you adjust to me? But she can't. She just simply can't. It's an old generation. Each generation as we're born, we're going to be wiser. We're going to be smarter. We're going to be more compassionate. We will be more happier. We're going to be more loving. And so imagine this is where you are. And that's where she is. And she cannot be on the same level as you are. It's just impossible. It's just saying a cancer person to feel happy. But they have a cancer. They're struggling. And I'm not saying she has a cancer, but in a way, our parents are in a way more crippled that way. They didn't get the love that they needed in order to be on our level. The same way your children are going to be wiser and smarter and happier. And there will be always a gap because each generation will be wiser, smarter, happier, and more loving and more compassionate. And so the question was your knowledge with your meditation that you're practicing, can you bring the compassion to mom that wants to be needed, that wants to be loved, but she cannot love the way you want to be loved. She cannot understand you the way you want to be understood because that's where she at and that's where she'll stay. And only by you bringing love and compassion, she can rise herself but she won't be able to be here but just rise you know just slightly and what i see is missing in this case is just you instead of avoiding and punishing bringing communication mom when you say this i feel like i want to detach and i want to push back because right now all i need is your understanding and your flexibility with me can you be flexible with me? Because I get mood swings sometimes. Sometimes I need space. I am pregnant and I want sometimes things my way. Can you adjust to me to this way? Bringing that compassionate, feminine, loving Gabriella that we all, by the way, know. But can you bring that to mom and bring that communication to her? That loving daughter that she really wants. And this is your way doing three steps back. Instead of doing ahimsa, here, mom, <laughs> I don't want your first two weeks at all, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and always like mm, letting go of the need to hurt her because as you're hurting her, she will want to hurt you back, and then this hurt going to continue back and forth. And you will be impacted, she will be impacted, your motherhood, the baby will be impacted. And the frustration is obviously going also on David. And everybody is impacted. Somebody has to be wiser. Somebody got to stop by himself. And it's not going to be mom. She doesn't yeah. have this knowledge. You are in this conversation. The newer generation will always be wiser always smarter, always more compassionate. No matter how much we are attached for them to being more loving and smarter and wiser, they are not. And it's a hard reality to accept. No, it's true. It's very true. <laughs>